Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest this week is Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times sports reporter John Branch, author of Side Country, a collection of his stories, almost 2,000 stories that he's had from the New York Times. He was able to whittle that down somehow. We'll ask him about it uh, when he joins us. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan, the Marshall Loeb Professor at the Stony Brook School of Journalism and co-founder of Digimenters. My name is Neil Parikh. I am the executive producer and guest host of the show. In addition to talking with John, we'll also talk about a major story on the front page about the Tulsa race massacre 100 years ago, and the fact that this is the last week of the at-home section. Uh, so we'll talk about those stories and more shortly. But first, we want to welcome uh, those of you who are joining us today. Thank you again. Uh, joining us, uh, Jonathan Borstein from uh, the East Village. Thank you, Jonathan. Always great to, to have you. And uh, we have Gunter as well uh, joining us from Vienna. Thank you, Gunter. Always great to see that we have an international audience. Um, particularly on uh, um, today is Memorial Day weekend, Memorial Day Sunday here in the U.S. Uh, so we have a number of folks. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on YouTube. And uh, we're also live on John's uh, Facebook and Twitter account. So thank you, John, for letting us do that. And welcome to all of his friends and colleagues who are watching. Pradnya Haldapur is joining us uh, from Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, I'm here in Springfield, Virginia, so not far from Pradnya. Linda Lawrence is joining us from, it's a chilly and drizzly Long Island. Uh, thank you, uh, Linda. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, our friend Steve, our colleague Steve Taylor, uh, who is on our production team, is watching on Facebook and on LinkedIn for us this week. Um, so again, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Uh, please uh, uh, like, comment, share, uh, tell us where you're watching from, and, and tag your friends so they know to join us. Uh, again, if you uh, missed the opening, our guest today is John Branch. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning sports reporter for the uh, New York Times and author of Side Country, uh, which is coming out tomorrow, June 1st. So we are definitely glad to have him joining us this weekend. Before we uh, jump into the uh, our show, we certainly want to thank our production team. Uh, we have a great team, Paula Kiger, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Carla Baranakis. Thank you for all of the great work that you do to make this show a success. And uh, with that, we also have a few more folks that have joined us, Parbodh Kumar. Uh, Sharma joining us from Riverdale, New York, uh, and Ellen Austin joining us from New York as well. Thank you, Ellen. Always great to see you. With that, I'm going to bring on uh, Sri Srinivasan, our host. Sri, good to see you. Great to see you, Neil. We uh, were uh, so excited. We're so excited to have John with us. Uh, we're going to be talking about his new book. I have it right here. Let me show you. Here is Side Country. Country. Yeah. And uh, this is a fantastic book, Tales of Death and Life from the Back Roads of Sports. As you said, 20 out of his 2,000 articles for the New York Times. He's a fantastic writer. Many of you know his work from Snowfall, uh, which was a groundbreaking uh, piece of journalism but he's done so many other great things as well. Absolutely. And, and we'll, we'll do a quick look at the papers and then bring John on. So big welcome to John's friends and family who are watching on all the various channels. We do this every Sunday. We've been reading the print edition of the Sunday New York Times out loud for more than five years, uh, often with uh, a New York Times or former New York Times guest, but also all kinds of folks. So if you'd like to be a guest uh, with us, please uh, drop us a note. We also want to thank our sponsor. Uh, the folks at Muckrack are fantastic. So we're very grateful uh, to the team there. Muckrack is a tool that you know if you're a journalist 
and if you're a PR person. So please check them out. And you, if you'd like to be a sponsor of our fun international show, please get in touch with us. You see our email addresses on the screen. Uh, we are so grateful to everyone who is watching. Tag a friend. They can watch now or they can watch later. Here is Ron Thomas, who was sitting at my home in New York City just last January, is watching from Dubai. Uh, thank you, Ron, for being with us. Very grateful to you. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne Camadoy. Yeah. And, and we want to give a quick shout out to Wayne for encouraging uh, John to connecting us with John to make sure that we got him on the show. So that was great, Wayne. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Pradnya is endorsing the fact that being on the guest, being a show guest on the show is a treat. Uh, our friend Patricia Freudenberg is watching as well. Um, thank you, uh, Patricia. Um, and it's her uh, daughter's graduation weekend. So that's, uh, that's great. Thank you, uh, Patricia. One thing I did want to point out, Sri, about uh, John's book uh, in terms of the blurb, my favorite part, this is a, a description of the book, as you said, breathtaking tales of climbers and hunters, runners, racers, runners and racers, winners and losers. But if you go down to the bottom of that uh, uh, section, John Branch has been hailed for covering sports the way Lyle Lovett writes country music, a fresh turn on a time-honored pleasure. Um, I actually hadn't uh, read all the way down to the description earlier. Uh, I'm a huge Lyle Lovett fan, so this that really resonates for me. Uh, and I'm looking, really looking forward to this show. John is going to be a great guest. Um, do we want to take a look at, uh, just a quick look at what's on the front pages? Sure, let's let's do that. I'm going to just pull up the paper here so that folks can see, and then we'll bring John on right after this. And by the way, please follow John. He's John Branch NYT on Twitter. Uh, the front page uh, lead stories about gun sales surging in U.S. torn by distrust, and there's this big story about the hundredth anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. Five pages inside, and an incredible treatment online, and we will look at that in a little while. Uh, the cover of the Times Magazine uh, here is very striking and also about uh, the Tulsa massacre. And by the way, this is the last in-print episode, uh, issue, sorry, edition of At Home. There will be an online version going forward. So I hope that means the travel section will be back. There's a kids, uh, the NYT for Kids section is there today. And then a 27-page dreamy recipes section and cooking all the cold creamy crunchy salty delicious things our food reporters and editors can't wait to eat or drink so with that uh we are ready now to have uh john with us so let's bring john onto the screen hey john good how are you guys good to see you uh good to, be seen. Good to see you guys it's early for you, right? It is. I'm based in California. Although, because I knew I was going to be on the show, I tried to come eastward um, <laughs> to make it a little easier. So I am in Salt Lake City. That's good. At least you, you bought yourself an hour. I bought myself. Uh, well, I'll leave you in Shree's good hands, and uh, we'll check back in later in the show. Thanks, Neil. Uh, everyone, you seeing the the way that we produce the show, and Neil as executive producer really makes all the magic happen. So, John. Welcome, and thank you so much for being with us here. We're super grateful to you. Uh, you know, you just saw the paper laid out like that. What do you think as you see that in 2021? Well, I'm thankful that people are still reading print, of course. Um, I'm a big print fan. That's why I got into this business was I was one of those kids in the uh, in the mornings that would go through the box scores and go through my, my morning paper. I'm old enough to remember the days when I couldn't see uh, highlights of sports events at night. Um, and so I had to wake up in the morning and try to get all the, all the scores. So huge fan of print, huge fan of the people in at our paper that, that do the print. I'm a little sad this morning because I am in a hotel room. I don't have the times in front of me. Normally I would be sitting up in my bed doing kind of what you do. I'm um, going through the Sunday paper, but today you're going to be teaching me. <laughs> and uh, tell us about how you, you and your family have handled the pandemic. What's it been like for you? Yeah, um, thanks for asking. We it's it's been fine. I, I consider myself very lucky. Um, no great impact. Um, 
certainly with my immediate family. So I think everybody has, has made it through safe and sound relatively. And yeah, we're just happy to kind of be getting out, out and about a little bit. I have two kids. I have a 19 um, year old boy who spent his freshman year of college in his room at home. Um, got to do all the worst parts of college, which was class and none of the fun parts of it. Um, but he's looking forward to going onto campus in the fall. And then I have a 16 year old daughter who, you know, like a lot of kids spent a year, roughly a year um, doing online courses and is now back in, in the school setting and is very thankful for that. So yeah, I'm, I feel like it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a dawn going on. Um, happy to be traveling again for work, that sort of thing. So we're, we're good, thank you. And you are actually, we, we're gonna watch the dawn uh, in Utah with you because that window is going to get brighter and brighter yep. as, we, as we go here. So I'll be putting on sunglasses in a little while. <laughs> I am uh, so happy that you were able to join us because I was always worried because you were it was a 5:30 start that we may not get you till you're all the way east. But we'll take Utah and take John Branch anytime. So I am excited about having your book. I've already started reading it. I can't wait to get you to sign it. So tell us about Side Country. Yeah, so Side Country is an anthology. Um, you know, I guess it's a kind of a greatest hits album. If uh, I don't know if Dexy's Midnight Runners had a greatest hits album, that would be it, or Baja Men or something. Uh, I'm, no, I'm, you have more I'm, hits than them. You have more hits than them. More than right, well, one hit. <laughs> oh, come on, Eileen. Um, yeah, I, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm I'm thrilled to have it. It's a great honor to have it. Um, it comes out on Tuesday, and um, it's 20 of the stories that really mean the most to me. Uh, the idea of side country, what that what that term means, it's a skiing term, and it means the area just outside the boundary of the ski area, you know, not quite the back country, it's the side country. And I thought it was a pretty good metaphor for the kinds of work that I like to do, which is just kind of on the outer edges of the sports world. Um, re relatable, reachable, uh, but not your mainstream sports. And so this book is filled with people that most people have never heard of. Uh, very ordinary people in really extraordinary circumstances. Everything from hunting alligators to setting world records of certain kinds. There's a, a story about speed cubing um, in that, the Rubik's Cubes, um, but also things like snowfall, um, some sort of outdoor adventure, kind of disaster sorts of stories. One about pulling bodies off of um, Mount Everest. Um, so a little bit of everything. Um, hopefully people will find a few stories in there that, that resonate with them. And I, I'm so glad that you were able to talk about the title. Let's talk about the subtitle. I know it's very deliberate, Tales of Death and Life rather than Life and Death. Yeah, a little twist, right? Um, yeah, the idea being because there are a lot of tales in here or a lot of stories in here that do um, deal with death. And I hope that readers will find that most of them have a little bit of spark of hope in them. And so I thought it was appropriate to say, yeah, there are tales of death in here, but they're also about life. Because these stories are really not so much about the people who died necessarily. They're really about the people who are left behind trying to find meaning in the life um, that has now been, been changed forever. And the image on the cover, someone in a, one of those flying suits, uh, how did you pick that over all the images you could have? It's very, very yeah. interesting. I'll just hold it up here so people can see. Yeah, it's a very striking image, isn't it? Um, that is actually Dean Potter. And Dean Potter was a really well-known climber, especially in the Yosemite area, and became a base jumper and a wingsuit flyer. Those are called wingsuits or squirrel suits. And I got to know him a little bit because he and I were going to do work on a story. Um, he believed that Yosemite and other national parks should allow these things. Um, they're illegal in the national parks. Um, and before he and I got together to write the story, he was killed um, in Yosemite. And that's a photo of him. Not his last flight, but it's a photo of him um, flying. So it's a beautiful, evocative photo, but also when I look at it, I think that's Dean Potter doing what he'd love to do and um, doing what ended up killing him. And we'll be talking about snowfall in a, in a little while. We'll be seeing it. Uh, you know, for people who know that you've written three books, maybe surprised that snowfall wasn't its own book, but is in here. Uh, how did you make that decision not to grow snowfall into its own publication? Yeah, I mean, it was it was long enough. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I just sort of felt that it, it spoke for itself. So, and I don't, I don't don't know that the people who were involved in Snowfall, which was about a deadly avalanche and the, and the survivors of that avalanche, I don't, I'm not sure they had the appetite to continue going down that road of me trying to pull more and more details out of it. Um, so, we decided to put Snowfall in into this book, and it's interesting because a lot of people think of Snowfall as this multimedia extravaganza. I was very blessed with having um, 
the best and brightest at the New York Times, both on the print side here that you're looking at and also on the digital side, uh, augment that story with incredible visuals, incredible graphics. Um, we're going to see if Snowfall holds up as a text in this book because it, it's going to be just nothing but black and white words. But um, I'm, I'm always proud to see the uh, the work of my colleagues here. Um, you mentioned Wayne Commodore is on the uh, on the uh, call here. Uh, he's a good friend of mine and um, he is one of the, the leaders of our, of our design team for print and he has had a hand in many, many, many of my stories, um, putting them together and making them beautiful for the, for the paper. We have a question from Amy Bass who says, how do you feel about Snowfall being in print rather than being in the interactive digital platform the New York Times put together, words and images? Uh, how does it read differently? Yeah, I think probably people on on this uh, on this show, Sri, um, can appreciate this. I, I, people will pull up Snowfall and look at these beautiful moving images that you can see on the interactive version, um, and I think it's very illustrative. And it does help the text because as you're reading the text, certain things will kind of unfold for you. Um, the print, obviously, being more static, is just different. But we and Wayne and and his his group made Snowfall into I think a 16 page special section. Um, and so it's a different tactile kind of experience where you can sit on a Sunday morning and, and read through it. And I know people um, started to read through it and then set it down for a little while um, and came back to it. Uh, I think it was really beautifully done. At the time, you can't see it there, but that very front photo, very, again, a very evocative photo there of the mountain. Um, Ruth Fremzen, a photographer at the Times uh, and, a, and a good friend of mine, she's been involved in, in some of these stories. Uh, she got up in a plane to take that photo of where that avalanche happened. And at the time, that photo ran on the front and the back of that special section. Wow. So it was a double side size uh, photo. And I think at the time it was the largest photo we'd ever run. I'm not sure we'd ever run a photo uh, that large before. Um, so again, people like Wayne and Ruth and so many people that are the digital and uh, visual wizards at the Times, nobody's been more blessed to work with them than I have. All right, we're gonna go to the New York Times and look at the papers in just a minute. But before that, I'll give you a chance to just mention your other two books, The Last Cowboys, which was called A Hell of a Ride by Car Carson Vaughn, and Boy on Ice, the winner of the Penn ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. Uh, one thing I do want to point out that this book, even if you're not interested in sports of any kind, you will love reading this because of this idea that there is literary sports writing. I'd like to think so, yes. <laughs> and yeah, so this is uh, th this is the Boy on Ice, uh, the book you wrote, and here are some you've done a lot about CTE and the brain damage caused by sports. Yeah, so this was a three-part series about the life of Derek Bogard. And Derek Bogard was a 28-year-old uh, enforcer, you know, one of the fighters in the NHL, and probably the toughest guy in the league. And unbeknownst to most of his fans, he um, really struggled with addiction to pain pills. And at the age of 28, when he was with the New York Rangers, he was found dead in his apartment in Minneapolis. And so this was a three-part series about his life and death. And as you can see, the, um, the print sections that ran when the story ran in three separate parts on three separate days. Uh, they went from the baby, you know, his early life to blood on the ice when he was an enforcer. And then his family donated his brain to the brain bank up at Boston University to be examined. And he had a pretty severe case of CTE, especially for somebody who was 28 years old. And CTE is the brain disease that's similar to like in a dementia or, dementia or Alzheimer's that is caused by um, hits to the head, by concussions and even sub-concussive hits. So a lot of boxers, a lot of football players, a lot of hockey players, a lot of people who um, are in sports where even if they don't feel like they're getting concussions, they're getting jostled and, and hit in the head enough times that it adds up. And, um, and Derek Bogart was one of the early victims that we wrote about, about with hockey. And I've written since then several more hockey players, unfortunately, who have passed away and were also found to have CTE. Yeah, and your focus on hockey has been very interesting because obviously most of the news has been about football players, but this affects soccer players and uh, other sports as well. Yeah, absolutely. I've written about soccer players, rugby players. Um, uh, Matt Futterman, a colleague of mine, has been writing about it now with the sliding sports, people like luge and bobsled athletes. You don't think about them because they don't usually have huge collisions but they're getting jostled so much that now they're finding um, brain damage and, and 
people like that. So it's it's a little bit of everywhere, unfortunately. Baseball players now, we just had a story in the past week in the New York Times about um, more and more concern about batters because pitchers are throwing harder and harder and harder and that ball is coming faster and faster. And about how do you protect these batters, especially their heads. And I think we're going to see CTE in um, some of these people who um, do sports that aren't just football and boxing and hockey. My sister-in-law, Dr. Deepa Menon, watching from Baltimore, says thanks for highlighting CTE in sports. She's a neurologist, so she mm. knows uh, uh, about all, 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 all of these issues. So thank you, uh, Deepa, and great to see you watching with us. Um, we want, we, we'll just look at some of your other work and then we'll get to the paper. So talk to us about what we're seeing on the screen. Oh, I love this. Uh, that This was the New York Times story about a family um, in Utah. Here I am in Utah. Um, that has a ranch operation, has had a ranch operation near Zion National Park for about 150 years, a very modest ranch operation. And they also now have a huge family of boys who are saddle bronc riders, um, two generations of boys that have now won world championships as bronc riders on the rodeo circuit. And this story is really about them trying to hang on to their ranch land. Um, at the time, at a time when more and more of the modern world is creeping in on them, um, especially near Zion National Park. If any of your viewers have been to Southern Utah, they know how crowded Zion and Rice have become in the last 10 or 20 years. And so now their ranch is really right up against Zion National Park. Could not be more stunningly beautiful, but there's a lot of pressures on them to sell the land, to cash out. And they think, well, this is where we've been doing this for 150 years. Um, so this story was in the New York Times a few years ago, and I turned it into a full-fledged book called The Last Cowboys um, that I'm very proud of. I just want to say hello to the friends and followers of Richard Deitch, the sports journalist. Uh, he just retweeted us, John, and so now we've got uh, hundreds of oh, new here they come. watching. <laughs> here they come. <laughs> That's the Richard Deitch effect. Uh, Richard's, uh, Richie, Rich is an amazing uh, writer and journalist, uh, and so folks you know, who follow him know that when he points you to uh, things, they're always interesting. And uh, I'm Sri Srinivasan. This is John Branch, and we're talking about his book, Side Country, and uh, which uh, debuts tomorrow. So it's out, but you can order it today. And please follow John at John Branch NYT. And a big thank you to Rich for uh, sharing the sh uh, show with him. We've been, we do this every Sunday morning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Of course, it's on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and is available uh, uh, after that as well. So please tag a friend. They can watch live or later. And Wayne, uh, who is part of the design team at the New York Times, says presentation of John's long-form journalism remains a template still a decade later online and in print. John is one of the best collaborators with graphics, design, and photography, and he's a nice guy. So that's the ultimate compliment uh, that you can get from a colleague. Thank you, Wayne. I'm <laughs> such a huge fan of Wayne's. Yeah, and Wayne, we've got to bring you on the show and uh, hear your your uh, insights as well. So uh, I think we're ready to look at the paper, uh, John. So uh, what sure. I'm going to do is just switch on the New York Times camera here, as we call it. And you, you see the paper laid out here, all the different sections. We won't get to everything, but the idea is, uh, as you know, you've, read the, you've seen the show before, just to... Uh, get a sense of what's in the print section and hear your thoughts and we'll come back to your book in a little while. So a uh, big story, gun sales surge in U.S. torn by distrust, a domestic arms race, an increase in female, black and Hispanic buyers, data says. And uh, of course, there's also, you know, there's an aspect of sports to guns in the U.S. And uh, what has been your experience uh, dealing with uh, guns and the gun story? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. There's actually a story in the book. The very last story is a very personal essay of mine. Um, I went and covered the the shooting in Las Vegas a few years ago. And as I got a call in the middle of the night to go to Las Vegas from my home in the Bay Area to go cover this, when I landed, I got word from home that there was um, somebody that I knew that was missing um, and was later found to be one of the victims. And so I wrote a very personal essay about that called the girl in the number eight jersey um, about my week of, of reporting a, a huge global news story at a time when the real story was back home with my uh, my kids and chokes me up just thinking about it. Um, so that story's in there and it's strange because my very first um, 
um, interaction with guns and that kind of story was Columbine. I was actually a sports writer in, in Denver when Columbine happened. And so rushed to Columbine and covered Columbine for a few days. And so, um, yeah, gun violence uh, hits me hard. It's it's the one part of the news that, that seems to get me every time, as you can sort of tell by the way my voice is cracking just thinking about it. And what people don't understand is that we are seeing uh, more gun sales and more gun violence uh, in these uh, recent weeks and months. Uh, do you have any sense of uh, hope for America when it comes to guns? We have something like 4% of the world's population and 40% of the world's guns, something like that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Without getting too political, um, I'm just a sports writer, but I, I don't know what it would take. You know, I think like all of us, we thought after Columbine, after, you know, I'm from Denver, after Aurora, after so many of these, Virginia Tech, and then certainly after Sandy Hook, um, you know, I sound like a lot of people saying, I, if not then, when? Um, when can we make, you know, some sort of common sense um, or take a common sense approach to this? Every time there's a mass shooting, I will retweet um, Nick Kristoff's story about what we can do to you know, some practical steps that we can take um, to you know not alleviate all the violence. You're never going to alleviate it all, but certainly slow it down and at least think about how we can prevent. I mean, I, I think it's not unlike COVID, where the numbers are so high that we've become numb to them. And um, yeah, that's uh, it's a frustrating one. So I would I would encourage people to go back and look at Nick Kristoff's column, which usually gets republished every time there's a, a mass shooting and, and updated by Nick. That is. A, a important advice. Thank you. With no panel, riot questions sure to linger. And this is about the politics of uh, judging uh, what happened uh, there. Somebody had a nice cartoon that said, you know, this is like the Nazis deciding not to, uh, you know, they voted against having the Nuremberg trials. Um, and this is a stunning recreation of the Tulsa race massacre from 100 years ago. And this was the home of Black Wall Street. And as we go inside the paper, we'll see there's five different pages, full pages about this. They basically recreated uh, this part of Tulsa uh, back 100 years ago. And also the online treatment's been really uh, important and everyone should see that. Orphaned mm -hmm. by COVID, two teens find their way. Siblings from Brooklyn rebuild lives a year after mom's death. And... Uh, from Russians, uh, ransomware made to order. Another, you know, this is a very worrisome front page here. Uh, house hunters want to leave cities and builders can't keep up. Rise in remote working alters home market. And we've certainly uh, know that that's, that's what's been happening. And to our readers, today is the final appearance of the at home section, which was introduced a year ago as a guide to living in a suddenly locked down world. We did our best to guide readers on how to cope with confinement with a big assist from you. And so we will take a look at the at-home section in a little bit. Let's go into the paper. We learned from your colleague, Stuart Elliott, that Tiffany had this spot for 100 plus years in the New York Times, the A3 ad, uh, and now it belongs to other people. Uh, let's see here. As we, as we go through this, if anything jumps out at you, please uh, feel free to comment. Latin Americans travel to U.S. for COVID vaccines. Uh, New York stands against anti-Semitism. There's a UJA Federation ad. Uh, and what do I do next? This is about those orphan teens and this beautiful story about them. Uh, city dwellers hoping to relocate, discover there's nothing to buy. And that's happening all over the country. And John, I'm sure you've seen that in California as well, people. Yeah, I think that story was based in California and in the Bay Area. People are, are leaving the Bay Area to go out to Central California, which I'm very familiar with Central California as well, having spent some time in Fresno. And um, yeah, it's a huge issue and it just adds to commutes, which creates more traffic. Um, it's, a, it's a tough problem. Uh, my colleague there in San Francisco, Connor Doherty, who's written a book called The Golden Gates or The Golden Gate um, about the housing crisis. He, I think, is one of the uh, co-bylines on that story. Nice. A prison called Insane, Myanmar's penitentiary for protesters and poets. And uh, stories that go beyond COVID, we're seeing all kinds of things. But here's a COVID story. British tourists are flocking to Portugal and they're mostly masked. Uh, what have you found in Utah? What's the masking story there? 
Yeah, so I'm at a sports event here. I'm actually at a uh, sport climbing event. That's a World Cup for um, for a sport that's going to be part of the Olympics, and it's outdoors. I'm, I'm pointing this way because it's over there. I can almost see it from my hotel room, and they're asking people to wear masks. So people around here, I think, are wearing masks most of the time, um, even outdoors, and that's similar to that in California. Um, I think we... Um, I happen to live in a place where I think masks were, were not a big debate. People were, were wearing them. So, and it seems to be that way for the most part here in Utah. Erdogan's opponents, here's a story, see opportunity after he angers a loyal province and watching the mice eat away your future. This is about grains, I guess, being eaten uh, in parts of Australia. Very sad. And this might be the first non-COVID India story in a while in the Times, or at least one getting so much prominence. In India, the effort to protect a stork is led by women. Carla Rhodes is, I uh, believe, the photographer here, is a wildlife conservation photographer who lives in the Catskills. And she's talking about the stork in India. Of course, India's coronavirus story is such a big deal. And uh, folks, keep telling us your thoughts as you're seeing these stories. Tell us where you're watching from. Tell us how your Sunday is going. Say hi to John. And uh, we'll keep looking here at the paper. In a surprise, UK's leader gets married for third time. And he's had a rough week. His biggest advisor and friend, and at one time the second most powerful man in England, uh, basically ranted against him for nine hours and said, London, England is led by, is lions led by donkeys. And <clears throat> I was trying to compare, John, what that would be like. It's like uh, maybe Steve Bannon, uh, you know, testifying against Trump. That's how close their relationship was. Yeah. Commencement piece speeches in the era of COVID. Um, do you read these? I love reading excerpts of uh, of, uh, of commencement speeches. I do. I love commencement speeches, and I love the videos of them. And I've been honored to have given a couple of commencement addresses, none of which ever get requoted or uh, go viral. So I need to work on it. Well, uh, I the only commencement speech I've given is uh, to uh, to an eighth grade graduation in a, a middle school in Brooklyn, but I loved every moment of it. It was a real honor. And here you see John Legend at Duke and Anthony Fauci at, the, at UNC and Ruby Bridges, a uh, civil rights activist at Tulane's commencement. Tribes are pressed to confront bias against descendants of enslaved people. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Native Americans and um, the kind of sports you cover uh, you know, we don't hear a lot about them in, say, major league sports, but uh, are they active in some of the kinds of uh, non-traditional sports that we see uh, that you've had a chance to write about? Yeah, actually. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but that was a great segue because there is one of the stories in the book is about the Hopi. Um, and the Hopi have a long tradition of running to them. Running is prayer. And I wrote a story, I spent a long time uh, with the Hopi and their high school boys cross country team, which at the time had won 25 consecutive state championships in, in Arizona, um, a streak that has since been broken. Um, but trying to sort of tap into the magic of how they do it and why they do it and why they're so good at it. Right, and that's well, things that you can find, one of the stories you can find in Side Country, John Branch's book, we're talking about the book, we're talking about the paper, he has 20 stories from his more than 2,000 uh, that he was able to uh, whittle down and, and put in the book. Was it a little bit like choosing your favorite child? You only have two children to pick from, but uh, how did <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, that's go? much easier. Okay. Um, no, no. The, uh, yeah, so They're sleeping, so they didn't hear Matt Weiland, who's my editor at WW Norton, came to me and asked about this. And um, I said, yeah, let me think about this. And there's no way to go through the New York Times archives and say, you know, John Branch, best stories or John Branch, favorite stories or something. And so I just did it off the top of my head and I wanted to put in stories that meant the most to me. And so I used my own mind as my filter and literally just got a legal tablet and started thinking, okay, the Hopi story, okay, Snowfall, and just started making a list of them and hoped that they would sort of um, create some sort of, you know, cohesive whole. Um, I think they have a lot in common. I, I realized that as I made that list, you know, the, my favorite kinds of stories are the stories that are done from on the ground that have a very human element to them that are not involving generally famous people. I'm not a believer that because people are famous, they're more interesting. I think it's often the opposite. Um, and so most of my favorite stories are about people that you've never heard of or about things that you probably don't know a lot about. Um, and so that's what this book is mostly involving. Um, 
so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that hard because I, I whittled it down and then I looked at it and kind of went. Eh. What was interesting, Sri, is that as a reporter, I never go back and read my old stories, and I I'm sure that's common. Typically, I write a story and let's say I'm covering covering a game and I write a story and I send it. I don't go and look at it the next day. I'm working on the next story. I never go back and read stories. And so in my head, I had a list of these stories that I thought I really liked that really meant something to me. Um, and then I went back and started to, to whittle down that list. And I started to go back and read some of those stories. And some of them, I was pleasantly surprised. I thought, oh, this is really good. I used to be really good at this. I don't know what happened to me because this story is much better than anything I've written since then. And sometimes I would get to a story and go, oh, man, I messed that up. That story was better in my head, you know, five years later than I, than it was at the time, so that got crossed off. Um, yeah, it's very strange to go back. I, I, I mentioned this to somebody else recently. It's it's kind of the opposite of say like a songwriter who, when you write a song, your your best hope is that you write the song and then you can spend the rest of your career singing that song in front of a live audience. Um, journalists are the opposite. You write a story and then you never look at it again. And um, it's interesting to go back and, and look at my stories again. Uh yeah, I, I, I'll just say uh, that uh, Jack Lynch, who was an editor at the Times for many years, I had the privilege of writing uh, freelance pieces for him. And one day I had left off something. Was it a correction? But there was something that I could have added to the story. Mm -hmm. And so I sent him a note saying, sorry, I didn't add this. And he said, you know, your the the story is lining a birdcage somewhere. Don't worry about it. Move on. But I, I never forgot that uh, these are, you know, in the digital age, there's, of course, more living stories than they than they used to be. We have some great yeah. comments coming in here. Ron Thomas says, every time I look at this show, it reminds me how much I miss the Times newspaper. And he's sad. He's watching in Dubai. Mm. And uh, we also have a nice note from Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar, who does She's On Call, a terrific medical show that we have the privilege of working with. Uh, and she says, hello from Chesapeake in Maryland. And I love reading these types of stories. So you do resonate the kind of work that you do. And Laura says, Snowfall was such a landmark piece. Love that integration of narrative and visual. Uh, why is it that we still talk about that? What was, for people who didn't see it, we want to get them to go back and look at it. Does the digital, we know the print side holds up and it's in the book. But what about the digital side? Does it hold up uh, all these years later? Tremendously so. Um, yeah, so we're almost uh, 10 years, nine years later, and it's still, I know, um, taught by many journalism professors. I get asked to talk about it quite a bit. That's probably the one story I've had to go back and read because I get asked to talk about it. I'm like, I better read this before we talk about this. Uh, it holds up tremendously because of how far in advance it really was visually in terms of the scrolling. Um, you know, we mentioned the the Derek Bogard, the CTE story a year before that. And if you compare those one year to the next, they were literally about a year apart. The Derek Bogard story was very much kind of the old style where you click from one page to the next. This one, as we see now on the screen, you literally roll through it, scroll through it. And as you're reading, things pop up. Um, some incredible visuals. Yeah, look at that. I'll tell you a, a backstory. I, I was I had written a good chunk of the story and had meetings in New York with our visual folks about what kind of visuals might be helpful to help tell the story. And that's what I'm really proud of is that these visuals aren't just decorative throw pillows, as I call them. They're actually journalistic elements that help people understand the story. And I remember I was sitting in my backyard when Jeremy White, who's one of our graphics editors, uh, texted me and said, are you somewhere where I can show you what I'm working on? You know, you had mentioned that you thought it'd be helpful to have a map or some sort of graphic that shows what the back of a ski area looks like, the side country looks like. And I said, yeah, I'm, I can get to my computer. And I was sitting in my backyard on my laptop and I unfolded the very early versions of what was that very first graphic where it's kind of a flyover coming into the ski area and it just blew my mind. And that was the realization that snowfall was gonna be something special. And um, again, nobody's been more fortunate than I have been to, to work with the visual folks at, at the New York Times. I can't sing their praises enough. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear that. And just look at just the opening screen is just uh, stunning. And uh, we, this was in 2012 that you wrote this. And then mm -hmm. uh, in 2013, uh, you and I got to meet. I want to just show uh, folks uh, where we met. Uh, it's an unusual place to meet somebody for the first time. We sat at lunch together, but it wasn't any lunch. It was the New York oh, the, the Pulitzer luncheon. And I, had, uh, I sat next to you, and we, you, you got your uh, 
certificate and uh, that's what it looks like you can see there and yep. the gentleman with his uh, fingers interlocked is uh, right there you uh, you you see um, right there part of your part of your team is somebody who's also in the other picture so why don't you introduce us to everybody who we see there that's hilarious story. Yeah, you and I met that day, and I don't think we've seen each other since then. And you were kind enough to take photos. I don't think anybody anybody at the Times was standing up to take my photo, so it was nice of you to do so. Um, and I honestly couldn't have told you exactly who was there. That whole thing was a blur. Uh, that's Dean Baquet. That's our editor of the paper there on the left of that first picture. And then me. I haven't changed a lick. Um, and Jason Stallman next to me, who is the sports editor. He now is, I don't know what his title is, but he oversees our uh, documentary um, division now, including like the recent one on Britney Spears. I got a lot of attention. Um, and then on, on the right is Steve Duenas. And Steve was the head of our graphics department, um, is now on the masthead as a deputy managing editor, I believe his title is, overseeing our visuals. So um, yeah, like, I couldn't be happier to be in that company and still be in that company. Awesome, great, great to see that. Uh, all right, let's uh, keep going, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have about 45 minutes left with John Branch. We're looking at the paper. We're talking about his book, Side Country, which drops tomorrow. And uh, we will uh, continue to get a chance to hear his thoughts on all kinds of topics. And Wayne Kamadoy, part of the design team, says, did you re-report on any of those stories in the book? or have a postscript included on some of them. And Wayne's waiting for his pre-ordered copy. <laughs> Come on, Wayne, I could have gotten Wayne a copy. Um, now I feel bad. Uh, did I re-report them? No, they, they are running as they ran in the New York Times. Really? Um, I did add postscripts. It has been interesting, actually. And, and I did do an introduction that talks a little bit about a backstory of, of Snowfall um, that was not part of the story. Um, the postscripts were interesting, and I wanted to reach out to as many of the people that I wrote about uh, to tell them that they were going to be part of this book anthology. So it's been fascinating to um, to reconnect with people and basically track them down and say, I don't know if you remember the story I wrote about you seven years ago, um, but it's now part of a book. And everybody has been really supportive, including the people I've been able to reach that were part of Snowfall. Some of these stories that were, you know, they were bleak, they were sad, um, but some of them were kind of fun. And I've had a, a nice time reaching out there. For example, Sri, there's a, um, there's a story in there that is, probably the zaniest story in there about competitive dog grooming and competitive dog grooming is a thing where they bring the dogs in and people then color them with dyes and blow dry them and shave them. And they create like tapestries on these dogs, often poodles. Um, and it's a fascinating sport and, or competition. I don't know what you call it. Um, again, side country. And one day I got a call from one of our photographers in New York saying that she was going to go out to the Meadowlands and, and film this. And here's what previous ones looked like. And she was going to shoot some photos. And should I come? And, and the lesson I learned is that when somebody invites you to a dog grooming competition, the answer is yes, you go. Uh, so I went. And it was one of the most memorable days of my career because it's so different and it actually was really kind of poignant in a way. And I think if you read the story, you might actually get a tear in your eye at the end. So I reached out to the woman who I wrote about, didn't really realize that she was a, a big deal, but she has now since won all sorts of big competitions. She was on a couple of daytime talk shows and I just, she sent me YouTube videos of, I guess there's a, a cable um, show of dog grooming now. And she is like the queen of dog grooming. I had no idea. Um, so she and I connected and she's thrilled that she's in the book. Um, it's hilarious. It's it's all fun. How does it work with the dog? The, once, the can, once he or she has been used as a canvas, do they have multiple dogs that they can for the next round or how does that work? No, there's only one round. Yeah, there, there's only there's only one round. Um, but they the are recovery, I presume, is is more complicated because they yeah. have to grow back the canvas itself. Carla yeah, I mean, Arnuck, so, some of these dogs they they will grow their hair out for months in anticipation for the big contest, and then they get there and they have to start with the, basically that canvas, and they start dyeing it and doing these things. And after an hour or two, you will have dogs literally that look like they might have a mane of a lion. Some panda bears are very popular and you will walk up to them going, is that really a dog? <laughs> um, yeah, it's strange. Uh, that story made it in there. And that's, again, one of those stories that I had such a great memory of because I remember exactly where I was, where I wrote it. They were, it was in the convention center at the, in Secaucus, I think. And um, they were pulling apart the entire place. They were, you know, I was getting 
people around me pulling chairs and tables and all the booths and stuff were all coming down. And I was on deadline sitting there on my backside on the concrete, um, cranking out a story that ran the next day with these awesome photos. And so I went back 10, you know, seven, 10 years later and thought, was that any good? And I went back and read it and thought, that was actually a pretty good story. Good job, John. <laughs> Carla Baranakis, uh, former New York Times sports copy editor who never got the privilege of working with you. She went on mm -hmm. to be national copy chief of the Times. Diane Stefani is watching and tuning in from a rainy New Jersey turnpike and her hubby is driving. So hello oh. to both of you. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, and I saw a nice comment from Jonathan Borstein who says, what I like best about, uh, what I like best is finding a story I forgot I wrote. <laughs> this happens. I have I have pitched stories that I've already written before. I think I have a great idea. And they're like, John, I think you already wrote that. Like, oh, yeah, I guess I did. And Diana says, the imagery actually makes me miss snow. I didn't think anyone could make me miss snow. Kelly girl, that's Diana, who is watching at, uh, I guess, 615 in the morning in, uh, in the Bay Area. So hi, Diana. Always great to see you. And here's one of your colleagues. Uh, <laughs> tell us about Juliet and well, uh, here's your question. She says, how do you come up with your story ideas asking for a friend? Oh, my dear Juliet, um, she's a dear friend of mine and a colleague of mine for a long time. She's a sports writer at the New York Times. Um, I think she's in Indianapolis covering the Indy 500, if I'm not mistaken. We never get to cross paths except for at things like the Olympics because we're always in scattered like the wind. Um, and she's written a ton about gymnastics recently in the last week or two, had a great story about Simone Biles doing a trick that nobody on earth would ever consider doing. And Simone, Simone Biles of all people is the one that can nail it because she can. Um, can I just ask you about that one, one, one aspect of that story? People have pointed out that she's, even though it's the most difficult aspect of what she's doing, she's not, it's not being given that degree of difficulty points. And because it, she's so dominant, and they're saying that when Michael Phelps was dominating, nobody said that, you know, he shouldn't be treated, you know, he shouldn't be acknowledged for that. Do you see uh, a, a problem with the way that that's being handled? Look how look how fast Neil is pulling yeah, this stuff yeah. up. Um, I do see that, you know, and, and it comes up more and more in the Olympics because more and more of the Olympic sports are subjective judging. Um, some of the sports I've covered, like snowboarding, um, there are judges. Ice skating is one of those. And if you get ahead of the curve too far, the judges don't know what to do with it. They see something that they don't know how to grade because no one's ever done it before in competition. And I think Simone Biles is, is in that camp where she's doing things where the judges are like, that, that was amazing, but we don't know. It must be hard. Um, they don't know how to score it. So yeah, to your point, Sri. Um, and it's funny what Juliet asks, because she and I talk story ideas quite a bit. And um, yeah, I don't know where story ideas come from. I think I have a somewhat of a childlike curiosity. I don't think I'm smart enough to, uh, to have anything but. And so a lot of my stories are really just, why do they do that? Or who, who is that person hovering around the team? Or um, I don't know, I've had, I've had my kids come up with story ideas. Sometimes my kids will ask me, dad, how do they do that? And I'll say, oh, and I start trying to dad explain it a little bit and then quickly realize I have no idea what I'm talking about. And I think that's a story. The story that comes to mind is I wrote about the mowing patterns once on baseball fields and about how when you flip on the TV, you can see uh, pretty instantly like, oh, we must be at Dodger Stadium because I recognize the way the, the grass is mowed um, and so my kids asked me, like, how do they make those patterns in the grass? I'm like, oh, kids, let me tell you, it's about how you uh... And after a minute, I thought, I have no idea what I'm talking about. So I turned it into a pretty big story about these groundskeepers. I called, I think, all 30 groundskeepers. There you go. Yeah, Neil's just rocking it here. Yeah. He is rocking it. Um, yeah. So anyway, the, the point is, and Julia knows this more than anybody else, that you just kind of have to think, what can I write different than... than um, anybody else. And my, my mission really in life is to write stories. I say this all the time is to write stories that you didn't know you wanted to read. And not unlike the Sunday paper of the New York times, I think the, the charm of what I try to do is that you don't have any idea. This is what you wanted to read. And it's just like flipping through the paper where it's just like a bunch of little nuggets of surprise. You know, if, we, if you knew it was going to be on the front page of the times or in each section, why would you read it? Um, and I sort of feel that way as a sports writer. Um, 
again, I, I'm happy to write about really famous athletes, and I know there's an audience for that. I think uh, the trick I try to do is to, to see if I can get you to engage and feel moved by people that you had never heard of and maybe a subject you've never heard of or know nothing about before you started reading the story. All right. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Juliet, hello. And uh, want to get you uh, here uh, in, the, in the New York Times read along. Uh, let's talk about this uh, spectacular piece about uh, about the Tulsa race massacre. You'll see here that it's in five pages, and Neil will also show us the online in just a second. But this is about a part of Tulsa, Oklahoma, that a uh, hundred years ago was known as Black Wall Street, and uh, was destroyed uh, in a race riot. White people pulling out black folks and and attacking them, and the Times has basically reconstructed this town and or this part of the town and showing us uh, what happened a century ago a prosperous black neighborhood in Tulsa Oklahoma perished at the hands of a violent white mob the Tulsa race massacre of 1921 killed hundreds of residents burned down 12 1250 homes and erased years of black success and it's something that we don't hear about in our history books it's not something that's taught and uh, so the story uh, as you know, people have talked about it over the last few years, but now it's really getting attention. And I don't know if you had a chance to see the digital version yet. I have, I haven't seen the print version. I'm kind of curious to know if Wayne, our friend Wayne that's uh, lurking around here, um, had a big hand in that or not. I've not seen the print version. I've seen the digital version, which is astounding. And I would certainly recommend if people don't have the times in front of them, they at least go online and, and look at the, at sort of the interactive graphic of that neighborhood and the history of it. Um, it's fantastic journalism. Yeah, and uh, let's see, Neil will pull that up in, in just a second. Here it is. And this is the digital edition of it, uh, digital version. And uh, here again, there's that scrolling idea, John, instead of clicking through, and now you're more immersed. Of course, the technology has changed since Snowfall mm -hmm. as well, but that same idea. So what the Tulsa race massacre destroyed, and you're able to see that here. Look at all those bylines and all these folks here. Uh, lots of uh, lots of folks working on this, and that's just the writers and photographers, I presume, more. Yeah, I mean, to that point, Sri, um, a lot of those people who work on our visual desks, they don't get a lot of limelight. Um, and certainly, Snowfall is a great example of that. You know, my name's at the top because I wrote the story, but there were, I think, 16 people that were involved behind the scenes doing things like this. Um, and it's nice when we do these more interactive projects to see their names at the top as opposed to the bottom. That's uh, that's awesome. And just look at this, such a great way to tell the story. And it starts with recording. That's the other part that maybe you can just talk about, John, that uh, this is not only a text story or a visual story. It's about reporting and going back in archives and things like that. Yeah, my editors will laugh when I say this because I write a lot of long stories, but um, it's just as hard often and maybe sometimes harder to write short things like this. I mean, you're taking this Tulsa race massacre of 100 years ago and creating this beautiful visual, but you have to make sure the copy is all really tight and really perfect. I, I, the copy editors that are on on this uh, can appreciate that. And so that is as much of a trick as, as if I were to, say, write 2,000 words on this. Um, and so it's very important that the reporting be sharp. And, and the other thing too, and I deal with this all the time because I write a lot of stories about subjects that I know nothing about when I start writing the subject or start writing the story, um, is that we have really smart readers. And so every story I write, there are gonna be readers who know, know more about the subject than I do. And so we have to be on our toes at all times because we know people are reading, which is a blessing. Um, but also a curse if you're not really careful. So something like this, there are certainly historians that will now look at this and see, did the New York Times do right by this? And um, that's that's part of the world we live in, and that's my favorite part of the world is that we're we're trying to do this so that they these stories become not just resonant but also educational. Yeah, and this is so sad. What what you you know we don't have time to go through it in great detail, but I encourage everyone to search and find this, and you'll see uh, individual people killed. Uh, by a white mob uh, and their little stories there, including uh, someone who was labeled America's leading Negro surgeon was killed. Uh, and it's just so sad that this this happened. And then Americans just, or America whitewashed the story or just ignored it. And, uh, and now I think 
part of this is, of course, the uh, anniversary, but also the effect of George Floyd's killing and the legacy of people paying more attention. You've seen this in your lifetime, John, that people oh, are no, paying no. more attention. Yeah, no doubt. And I know people who grew up in Oklahoma that didn't know anything about this. That's how you know whitewashed it was that it happened in their own town, people from Tulsa who didn't know the whole history because it wasn't taught in schools even there. Um, so yeah, it's it's we're way overdue for reckonings on these kinds of things. Um, and I'm glad to see the Times doing our part to, uh, again, you know, part of our mission, I think, is to educate. I see every story I write as a chance to educate. Um, we're not dissimilar to teachers who just happen to have a different kind of a forum. Thank you, John. All right, we're uh, still in the front section and we've got uh, maybe another four hours to go. I hope the sports climbing expo will wait for wait on you, John, as we go through this. Uh, here is, uh, sorry, I just, can I just go back and Andrea had a tweet. Let's just read Andrea's tweet. Uh, it's, uh, she said, uh, I think this piece is about 10 people in the byline and 20 more contributors. Incredible graphics. And Wayne says, Andrea Zagata, who also is with Sports Designer Chops, designed this for print. We try to provide different reading experience for the same piece. And Andrea, congrats on your work on this. Uh, so important. Uh, truly appreciate you uh, doing that. Thank you. Uh, and Laura says, I'm considering writing to my AP US history teacher, asking, him, did you know about this? Laura, uh, thank you, Laura's former guest on the show and uh, uh, this uh, wonderful uh, friend. Okay, here we go. Mary, uh, I, I'm a big connoisseur of obits. I don't uh, know. Uh, your thoughts on them, but uh, I'd love to hear uh, what you've done. I'll just read these headlines here. Mary Beth Edelson, a pioneer of the feminist art movement, died in, uh, dies at 88. Gavin McLeod, McLeod uh, 90. Mary Tyler Moore and Love Boat actor is dead. Uh, I uh, saw him in the Love Boat first. Uh, and Harvey Schlossberg, 85. Traffic cop with a PhD in diffusing hostage crises. Uh, and uh, Wimar Witolar, 75 media personality in Indonesia. In his serious life, he was a lecturer and a real estate developer. Uh, tell me about you and Obits. Yeah, I'm a big Obit fan myself. Um, I don't know if that's, that's a sign of age or not, um, but I, I, I've written a few and I, I have friends, you know, Rich Sandomir, for example, was a colleague of mine at, at the New York Times sports section for a number of years, and he now writes obituaries and I think loves it. It's again, it's a chance to illuminate a life. There are basically many features the way we write them and um, to kind of uncover um, under some deadline pressure um, who these people were and, and you can get kind of literary with our obits. Or the New York Times is pretty famous for their obits, and I'm a huge reader of them, yeah. Uh, by the way, I want to tell everyone about Miss You, Graham, which is available on iOS and Android for those who want to uh, pay tribute to people who have passed. Miss You, Graham is available on iOS and Android. All right, let's look at the sports section. Uh, big day in soccer yesterday, the Champions League final. Chelsea thwarts the Manchester City juggernaut was the story. Did you get a chance to catch this? I did not see it. I was too busy watching rock climbing. I did get a chance to cover that game about 10 years ago. I think the last time Pep Girardi, uh, Girardi won that, uh, the, the Champions League, I was at that game at Wembley Stadium. But um, I did not see yesterday's game. I was too busy with rock climbing. <laughs> Osaka's hurdles at French Open, media and clay. And by the way, she has said, as you may have read, that she will not do interviews this entire um, uh, French Open, and she says, I'll pay whatever fine they levy on me uh, because it's bad for my mental health to uh, to be in those press conference settings. You've been in those. Uh, what is your reaction to this? Yeah, I thought my colleague, uh, Chris Clary there, has a really good and nuanced take on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer that, you know, access is key. Um, I appreciate that Times are changing, that social media is changing this. I saw that Chris quoted Billie Jean King, who basically said, look, I understand mental health is an issue and we don't want to um, diminish what she's going through and what kind of kind of triggers maybe these press conferences are. I've been through a zillion press conferences. I, I, it's hard for me to imagine what kind of triggers they might be, but let's give her the benefit of the doubt. And um, But as Billie Jean King said, I also think you know that sport doesn't grow without and no sport really grows without at least some sort of assist um, in terms of going through the conduit, which is what the press generally is, um, to the public. Um, again, I appreciate that 
that athletes don't need us as much as they as I used to, to to get their voices heard. Um, but I don't love the trend if that's going to be where it's going, where athletes then basically say, "I'm not talking to anybody," and my message will be simply through my through my own social media accounts. Um, I'd like to think we have a role as somebody who can sort of filter through some of the stuff that um, that athletes say and do. And She'll be fined twenty thousand dollars for each time she misses it. So in a tournament like that, it could be five. You know, hundred thousand dollars could rack up. Uh, none, that's not a lot of money for her uh, because of all the money she makes. But no, and every round she goes, she'll make more money. So, um, you know, if she loses in the second round, she only she's only going to be fine for I guess maybe two. Uh, so I think she can afford it. Carla says Billie Jean King used to have to explain the scoring system of tennis yeah. in her early press conferences. What's that about? Yeah, I, you know, people were new to it. So you mean uh, the journalist didn't know enough, so she she'd have to. Well, I hope I hope that's not true. <laughs> I, I hope that's not true. Or maybe she was explaining it to the audience. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So I, I've got to hear more from Carla on that. And here's Juliet's story from the Indy 500. A power couple looks to win the Indy 500. Uh, Scott Dixon preparing for practice, uh, and Dixon and his wife Emma Davies Dixon. She's even more competitive than he is. She uh, says about her. So. That's interesting, and Juliet's a great journalist. Uh, okay, now you get to pick where we go next. Well, I'm going to go at home since it's its last uh, hurrah here. I'm sad yes. about this. Yes, the last print edition of At Home. They've said that the newsletter will continue and as a digital version will continue, but uh, this is the last version. Oh, look at this. At home and not at home. <laughs> So they clever. created two covers. <laughs> so each each one here. So keep out. And here's somebody there. <laughs> here's uh, what looks like a tornado shelter. And maybe that's somebody coming out of there. And uh, here's people connecting. That's lovely. I think this is really beautiful done. Beautifully done. And the editors say, we're heading out the door. And Amy Vership, the editor, <laughs> Uh, says uh, this is her goodbye letter. And uh, we were uh, privileged, John, to be in her home as she read the travel section with us uh, last January. Neil got to go to her home and met Seth Modak, uh, Seb Mo Modak, who did the 2019 places to go, uh, which was great fun. Amy is wonderful, and we wish her the best and look forward to seeing the travel section return. What are you looking forward to most this summer? So what about you, John? Oh, I'm looking forward to lots of things. Uh, the Olympics, if they happen, work-wise, and I'm looking forward to, in a couple of weeks, I'm gonna jump into an, a rented RV with my family and go full Clark Griswold and do a <laughs> national park vacation back, actually back here in Utah, through uh, the national parks of Utah. So follow me on Twitter and Facebook. It, it could, be, could be a wild ride. Uh, John Branch, NYT. Uh, so you're on the you're on the list of people who've got you who you've got the uh, Tokyo assignment. Is that correct? That is correct. Yep, man, and, Julia, I believe yeah. too. Yeah, and how will you? Uh, when will you? What is your sense of what's going to happen? Are they going to in fact have the games? And of course, I know you want them to have the games, but yeah, you know, it's interesting. I've been talking to people here at this at this climbing event, USA Climbing. Climbing is going to make a debut at the Olympics this year, as long as they're held. Um, they're moving forward as if they're going to happen. They I think generally think they're probably going to happen. I don't think it's a certainty still. If there could be a bigger outbreak in the next few weeks that could change things. Um, I think they're going to be hermetically sealed as much as possible. So I think the athletes are going to be very constricted or, and restricted um, about where they can move and testing will be constant. And I think for the media, though, there are going to be a lot of Zoom interviews. Um, and it doesn't sound like there's going to be many fans at all. Um, so it's going to be a very strange made for TV event. Um, I feel bad for these athletes that have not only had to have their dreams delayed by a year, but now we'll go there and have none of really the normal experience. There may not be an opening ceremony the way we know it. There may not be any crowd um, watching them perform or watching them get a medal. Um, all those kinds of things that we that we are used to seeing with the Olympics are going to be different if they if they're held at all. Uh, I hear that the athletes, as soon as you are done with your event, you win, lose, or tie, you are sent. You're asked to leave the country. Is what I. What, so they're not yeah, going to hang around for two weeks and tour and celebrate and wear your gold medals to the bar where I presume you know you never pay for a drink and things like that. Right. I'm told they have two days to get out. Yeah. So 
that's tight. Uh, here is uh, make the world better with one of these nine ideas. I haven't had a chance to jump into any of them, but some of them are obvious from what from the headline, but some are not so clear. But I did want to point out pedal towards positivity because our friend Steve Taylor, who's helping produce this, is a big bicyclist and so or cyclist and so pedal towards positivity. Let's keep America's pandemic biking momentum rolling is one of the nine ideas here in this story. And here's a plan your summer planner. Of, uh, and then reset your boundaries, reassess your spending and saving. I think that's good advice. And transport yourself with a literary escape this summer. And uh, some older books here. Look at this, how Stella got her groove back, the talented Mr. Ripley. That's going back to 55. To Evil Under the Sun by Agatha Christie, 1937. And I want to add John Branch's book, Side Country. Great <laughs> summer reading. Uh, drops tomorrow. Uh, Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday officially. Uh, sorry, Dops Tuesday. Yep. Uh, but of course, you uh, you can order it online right now. Become an outdoor scientist and enjoy a drink with a twist. And uh, are you a puzzler? You know, it's funny. One of the um, the virus effects has been I've gotten into crossword puzzles. I, I set aside, as you were going through the paper, I set aside the uh, the Sunday magazine. And usually Sunday night, I start working on the crossword. And I've never done that before until this past year. Nice. Speaking of the summer here, there are summer vibes. All the crunchy, cold, creamy, salty, delicious things our food reporters can't wait to eat and drink. Uh, are you a cook? Um, I'm a heater. No, I, <laughs> I, I, I cook a little bit. Yeah, I'm okay. more than anybody else in my family. That's for sure. All right. And here, here are all kinds of things. Grilled oysters with hot butter sauce. Uh, this is a section that... Uh, lends itself to easy saving if you have the print, uh, print edition. But we are also, of course, subscribers to the cooking online section, which is just terrific, what Sam Sifton has done. Well, I want to make this matte cucumber quick kimchi. So I'm going to make that and lots of recipes here. All right, you get to pick where we go next. We have about uh, 20 minutes left with John Brandt. Oh, my gosh. Um, let's just go right there to Sunday Styles. Okay. It's, it always feels so nice in your fingers, right? <laughs> yes, it does. Higher it's quality paper. Higher quality paper. That's right. The Hamptons crawl. Ragers on the beach. Rapidly disappearing restaurant reservations. A parking app and a glass elevator are all hot topics. Who remembers COVID? And when was the last time you were in the Hamptons? Uh, I don't know that I've actually been to the Hamptons. Oh, okay. Really yeah, I've never made it that far out. <laughs> yeah, and you. Like the one time you don't want to go is in the summer when it's so packed and crowded. Uh, polo t-shirts. Uh, I did I miss the uniform unveiling of the U.S. uniform? Do you, did you catch that? Um, you know, the I don't design? know if it or not because I'm not sure. I've seen it. Uh, mm -hmm. I do know that the climbers were just given their uniforms yesterday, so they're out. So okay. So I just I guess I just missed it. Uh, she this is modern love. She put her unspent love in a cardboard box. And for over two decades, her daughter has been taking it out. And uh, we had uh, Dan Jones, the editor of Modern Love and the column and the podcast and the series uh, here in your seat, John, uh, a few weeks ago. And that was awesome. And uh, we'll just read the, the tiny love stories because we only have time for that. Now, no secrets. My boyfriend signed up for a dating app under the guise of swinging while staying partnered. He managed my account and swiped through men for me. My boyfriend arranged a meeting with Juan for strictly casual sex. Juan shared stories of his past polyamorous partnerships and, and expressed a deep affinity for honesty. We didn't have sex that night, but I did break up with my boyfriend a week later after learning he had been cheating on me when we were monogamous. Now Juan and I are still in an open relationship, this time without secrets, just satisfaction. Lauren Bernalis piece. I guess you never know what you're going to read out loud. No, sorry, you might need to put a PG-13 rating on this. Uh, real <laughs> exactly. I didn't. I didn't mean to uh, do that, but that's what happens when you read things cold. Okay. So now <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot, and I'm going to read you one of the social cues column uh, questions. There's no right or wrong answer, but Philip Galanz always has a great answer. This is the etiquette column, different from the ethics column in the in the uh, magazine, as you know. All right, um, let's see. My boyfriend's brother is really bad at collecting debts. When we go out to dinner, for instance, he will pay with a credit card and tell us all 
he'll he'll Venmo request once he figures out what we owe. Because of this, I don't thank him. Then weeks go by without a Venmo request. My boyfriend likes that his older brother is forgetful and refuses to remind him. I don't like owing people. <laughs> Please help. Uh, sign accidental moocher. So what is your advice to this accidental moocher? Yeah, I think I'd like to have more friends like that. <laughs> uh, okay, here's Philip's answer. And Philip uh, says, how exactly is this accidental? Is this mooching accidental after a few days? It seems quite intentional to me. Unless the brother's Venmo story is merely a charade to pick up dinner tabs without argument, you're both taking advantage of his absent-mindedness. I suggest texting him, what do you owe for dinner? <laughs> Just like that, he'll probably tell you. And then you can pay and next time work out what you owe at the table. It's really not that hard and uh, drop calls in the Hamptons. This is uh, a new, another story about the Hamptons. They said they didn't want to sell tower and now they're complaining about drop calls uh, all, over, all over the Hamptons. Uh, is this implying that short shorts are back? I, mean, I can't tell from, from this. Let's hope not. <laughs> okay, uh, let's keep going here. You pick. Um, let's go business. Okay. And uh, a Chinese dream denied. This is uh, a mother of two just wanted a better life for her children. How did she become a nationwide symbol of the people behind, left behind in China's great economic boom? It started when her husband vanished, his white car plunging into a river more than 50 feet deep. Frankly, this is not the kind of story I expected on the front of the business section, but maybe it's a long weekend and people have time and I guess people will be able to read this. Uh, this sounds very powerful story. Uh, here we go. Let's see what else is in business today. Before she was a CEO, she was a janitor. Wow, the Beth Ford is the chief executive of Lando Lakes, the uh, mm. butter company. That sounds like a great story. Uh, I, I want to read that for sure. Our digital pass weren't supposed to be weaponized. Social Security rethinks its customer service. And this is that Chinese uh, the story from China by Javier Hernandez and Jun Chen. Powerful stuff. Okay, where are we going next? Well, real estate, which will um, <laughs> always make me weep a little bit. All right, so the real estate is Cal. Oh, here you go, California. There we go. Californians are on the move. Residents are leaving cities in search of more space and a lower price tag. Uh, so that's this is sort of like the story on the front page, isn't it? Um, yeah, and that, yeah, that, and I can speak to this because I live in California in the Bay Area, and, and just what a housing crunch there is there. And you know, part of the effects is that people. One of them is that people are moving out and and throwing themselves farther and farther away from where they work, which creates other kinds of issues because they don't really have an option if they want to live a certain way. And part of it is the homeless problem that is um, growing and growing. So, housing is a big, big topic. I think for the next uh, decade. Um, Connor Doherty, as I mentioned before, is going to be busy for a while on this beat. I do. I, I just want to point out that Steve Taylor is uh, putting links to uh, the store, many of the stories we mentioned, including that CEO story, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So if you get a chance and you want to read any of these stories, he is live uh, annotating the uh, conversation here. And by the way, Carla says it's true. Be Billie Jean King told that to that story about having to explain scoring system in tennis in her earlier press conferences at the Association of Women in Sports Media Convention. So that's uh, 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 fascinating. And yeah, so this is on my LinkedIn and my uh, Facebook. If you're following along, you will be able to see uh, Steve's uh, links. Thank you, Steve, for doing that. Okay, we're. We're uh, close, but we have 15 minutes left. So go ahead, John. I, I can't see very well. I can see the review there. OK, we'll just look at the Sunday review. And the stories we love make us who we are. At Salman Rushdie on the front page of the, of the review. And I, I will be definitely reading this. And cops don't belong at Pride is Roxane Gay's piece. And it might just save our lives. This is Nick Kristoff. The pandemic has shown us more than ever we inhabit two Americas. And his incredible book that everybody should read, Tightrope, that written with his wife, Cheryl Wu Dunn. The Secret Recipe for All Fun Parenting, Frank Bruni's column. Uh, he's ending his uh, days as a full-time columnist uh, and mo moving to Duke. 
And here's the editorial in the New York Times, working less can save lives. Putting limits on labor isn't just a perk. Research shows that long hours on the job are increasingly leading to deaths. And uh, this is something that I've been struck by, how the lab leak theory out of Wuhan, John, was you know, dismissed as kind of conspiracy theory by Pompeo, I mean, uh, proliferated by Pompeo, Trump, and others. And now suddenly it's, it's come back front and center. The Biden administration has called for a report on it, but there's no real new, anything new that's come out. It's just pressure that's causing this. Yep. I'm, and, I'm, a, big, I'm a big believer in, in finding truth. That's what we do. So let's, let's keep looking into it. Yeah. Maureen Dowd, ex commish with the dish about, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, Bill Bratton, who was uh, the police commissioner, I believe, twice in New York City. Okay, let's look at the Times Magazine. And uh, this is about uh, when Les Lessie Benningfield Randall was six years old. A white mob destroyed her community and killed hundreds of her neighbors a century after the Tulsa massacre. What does justice look like? So this seems like a more personal version of that, in that very big five-page story in the, in the Times. Uh, let's see here, uh, the Times Magazine. Any thoughts about the magazine and uh, what, what, you know, how you, uh, what do you think of it? Yeah, I love the magazine. Um, it's usually the last thing I, I pull out. It's when I was traveling more, it's one of those things that I end up collecting a couple. Those in the New Yorker, I tend to put in my bag and then read them in bunches. <laughs> I do that exactly on the plane because these are so timeless that you can, you can read them uh, later. Uh, some of your stories could easily have been in the magazine, right? But they are put in the sports section. Yeah, I've written for the magazine a couple of times. Um, yeah, and that's a, it's a great honor. I think it's a little bit of a different audience. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes the magazine, it, it really is a separate magazine. So there sometimes are stories that are in the magazine that could have been in the sports section. And, um, you know, I think maybe sometimes we have to talk a little bit more about what we're each working on because there is some sort of cross pollinization sometimes. All right, we'll, we're just gonna take a look at this poem. It's a very short poem and it's got a sports angle here. Len Bias, uh, who was a basketball player at the University of Maryland and uh, his story here, at least in the headline, Len, or in the title, Len Bias, a bouquet of flowers and Mrs. Brooks. Ms. Brooks, she, he arrives in the middle of her reading. She has to stop and take the, and taking the flowers he's brought, kisses the beautiful young man whose yellow socks are her dowdy sweater's antithesis. What's said between them is killed by applause, but not his smile, which is the smile of a boy standing in the silence he's created and not her magnified stare, which says she understands why he's arrived late, he's already leaving, and that he's sorry. And this is a poem by Michael Collier. More, yeah, go ahead. I was uh, just saying, is that Tony Hawk right there? Yes, I was gonna say, yes, this is your uh, your part of the world, uh, side, this is a side country story uh, or a side country sport that has obviously gone on to, thanks to Tony Hawk, become a, a, even more mainstream. Tony Hawk and how skateboarding evolved with society. Yep, skateboarding is going to be at the Olympics along with climbing and surfing. Those are three, three of the new sports that I'm covering. A week ago, Sri, if you and I would be talking, I would have been in a different hotel room than this one in Des Moines, Iowa, where there was a skateboarding event, a qualifier for the Olympics. And the second, I mean, this is literally true. I walked into the venue um, last weekend and within 15 seconds, a group of people, one guy did this to me and he goes, oh God, I thought you were Tony Hawk. <laughs> That's funny. But Tony's still uh, uh, able to compete and uh, he's, he's taken his sport, his uh, e-sports, uh, he's done a lot with that, hasn't he? Yeah, he's he's an amazing guy. I mean, certainly as a skateboarder, but also he has managed to keep like all of his cool street cred with the young kids. The young kids love him through video games and the fact that he still skates. Um, even the young kids, and I literally saw twelve year olds competing for the Olympics last weekend. Um, think Tony Hawk is cool. You know, I'm he and I are about the same age. I'm like, am I cool? And I don't <laughs> think they think I'm quite as cool as Tony Hawk. But, but tell me, there are twelve year olds competing in what sport? Yeah, in skateboarding. Um, yeah, so it's interesting because, you know, a lot of a lot of sports always had um, minimum age requirements. But when skateboarding got added, part of the deal was we don't want that minimum minimum age requirement. 
And so in skateboarding, especially along, along the women's side, uh, we're gonna see some competitors that are literally 12. I think she'll, one will be 13 in July, but 13, 14 year olds are probably gonna vie for the gold medal. One of the, one of the things we've learned in the last few months and years is that uh, maybe in gymnastics, we were aiming too young for <laughs> uh, women, especially, and now we're seeing older women do well. Jim Downing, great issue of the magazine this week. Okay, let me ask you this question from Kwame Anthony Paya's ethicist uh, column. Is it okay to ask healthcare providers if they're vaccinated? We're reading about hospitals where nurses and doctors are not getting vaccinated on purpose, in at least in the U.S. Uh, what What do you say about, what would you say to this, John? Yeah, sure. I, I'm never afraid to ask questions. That's what I do. So yeah, I would ask, hey, are you vaccinated? Yeah. Uh, good point. Um, self mesmerism. So I guess this is what is this? Uh, is that uh, what does that mean? Uh, do you think it's like hypnotizing yourself? Is that what this is? I don't know. <laughs> and then how to spend your guaranteed income? I guess if 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 that comes to be. All right. Uh, Tejal Rao. Yeah. Tejal Rao uh, is writing about uh, jackfruit, and this is a perfect vegan meal, especially in the spicy and tangy sabzi, sabzi, which means vegetable from West Bengal. Uh, we're from Kerala in India and uh, jackfruit is a big part of our lives. Uh, have you been to India? I have. In fact, one of the stories in, in side country is about bringing, it's about a, a, a four Indian climbers that um, had a quest to climb Everest and their, um, their summit push went awry and three of them died. And so I spent a lot of time in Calcutta um, with the families of those who died over a year trying to get their, their loved ones back. Kneel on and again. Yeah. Um, they died right at the end of the climbing season on Everest. And the way Everest works, and it's really about this time of year, the climbing season ends and the storms come in, in the summer and most people don't go up Everest again. And so these people had to wait a year to see if their if their loved ones' bodies could be found on Everest. And if they could be found, how were they going to get them back home for a proper cremation uh, back in India? So a couple of years ago, uh, Josh Hayner, who's a big part of many of these stories, a photographer and a good friend of mine, um, he and I spent a lot of time in Nepal and India uh, chasing that story over a couple of long trips. Can you talk about what happened in ultra distance running this past month? A kind of shocking story. 21 people died in a single race? Yeah, there was an ultra running um, uh, race in, in China. And, you know, people are running 100, you know, 100 miles at a time through crazy high terrain. And a storm came along, a really cold and windy storm. And um, you mentioned how many people? 20? 20 21, I, I read. Yeah. 21 died. And these are, you know, some of the best athletes in the world because this is what they do. And they got caught in a, in a freak storm. Wow. And it's, it's, um, created a lot of questions. And Matt Futterman, again, a colleague of mine, has been on this story really hard, created a lot of questions about, you know, as we do more and more of these kind of out of the box kinds of um, events in, in more and more far flung places, what kind of responsibility do the people who put on these events have to um, make sure these people are, are protected and, and are safe? Including, by the way, the leading Chinese runner uh, in this in this sport uh, died, and so this just that per, just to see any sport where one athlete dies gets lots of headlines, but twenty one uh, of the leading uh, uh, yeah two of China's greatest athletes died in this in this one race. So uh, and then look how the New York Times runs this story in Chinese as well uh, because of the interest that'll be there. All right, we're almost out of time, John. Uh, there's a great story in here about Andrea Smith, the native uh, the uh, academic who claimed to be Native American and then who exposed as not being in there and lots of other stories. We'll just quickly look at the Metropolitan cover is Storm Clouds Under the Rainbow. Is pride too corporate? Should police officers be allowed to march? Is it a revolution or is it a party? And in fact, you saw there was an op-ed piece saying police should not be allowed to march. And New Yorkers feel the joy of roller skating again. So if, instead of just roller blading, you can see here roller skating. Or between short shorts and roller skating, bring back the eighties. <laughs> and uh, you, you may know this: uh, is roller blading uh, at the Olympics? Uh, no. Okay. No. Uh, the, Not yet. Yeah, and uh, the kids issue is the money issue. The four kids section is the money issue. 
fake money through history, how to build your own business. The stock market explained 100 ways to make dollars. And uh, this, I know, will be something that uh, parents, the section, parents will want to save for their younger children. I think our kids are too old for this, John, but I wish this was around in the early days. Uh, Jim Downing says it's rainy Saturday in Madison, New Jersey, so more time to read. Sunday playing out of the way, out the playing out the same way. And that is nice because I know Jim Downing. He's an old friend of mine. I lived in Madison for a number of years. So hello, oh, Jim. That's very okay. nice. That, nice. And then we'll just glance at the uh, arts and leisure section. Summer movies, ready or not, here they come. Uh, are there any movies? I don't even know what's coming out, but there is a quiet place uh, sequel that's coming out, I know. Yeah, I'm the wrong guy to ask. One of the things with COVID is I've been going back through old movies and a lot of old foreign movies. So that's sort of been my thing. I, I'm, I think I'm living backwards. I'm starting to kind of go Benjamin Button. With my <laughs> By the way, uh, if, you if you've if you been to uh, Calcutta, then you will appreciate that uh, uh, HBO Max has all the great Satyajit Ray films uh, mm. on HBO Max available now. Uh, it's a cent centenary of a centenary of his of his of his life and so it's worth uh, uh watching if you want to watch foreign films uh with an india connection the such as ray collection is there and the book review covers up in arms by randall kennedy uh the second about the uh, runs and gun gun race and guns in a fatally unequal america and america on fire the untold history of police violence and black rebellion since the 1960s by elizabeth hinton these are reviewed by peniel joseph and randall kennedy actually the second is a book by uh, Carol Anderson. So looking forward to reading that. I'm sure you uh, study the book review. I do. I do. I love the book review. I love I love the New York Times. I love it all. <laughs> I, I really do go through every section of the Sunday paper. Um, so it's kind of fun to watch you do it. Well, uh, thank you so much, John. We are almost out of time. And here's Neil. I'm sure there are some questions and uh, some comments that we didn't get to. So Neil will let us know. But John, I uh, want to give you a chance to give us some final thoughts before we say goodbye. And we'll be following you at John Branch NYT for the Olympics coverage, but also for some of the adventures and hopefully no misadventures when you're with your family in the RV this summer. Yeah, well, thank you. It's been an honor to, to be here. It's a really cool show. And and literally, I think it's a great thing for the New York Times that you do this. Um, nobody's a bigger fan of the New York Times than I am. And to see people that obviously come together on a Sunday morning because of some, some sort of shared love or respect for the Times uh, means a ton. So thank you for what you guys do. Thank you. And we'll let you go, John. Thank you very, very much. But before you go, John, I uh, oh. wanted to thank you again for joining us. This was incredible. What a great sweep in terms of being a look at your coverage, look at your stories, talk about your book. Um, my one regret is that we didn't get a chance to talk about Spaceballs um, and uh, your connection with Mel Brooks, Dick Van Patten, and uh, Joan Rivers, I think, was there as well, right? It's a story yes. inside country. I mentioned in the in the book that you most people are not going to recognize most of the names in that book, but Mel Brooks does make an appearance in that book. All right. So then people should definitely, that's another reason to get that book. Uh, and by the way, it's dedicated to those daring enough to share their stories with me in these pages and elsewhere. It's a lovely dedication. The book is called Side Country, Tales of Death and Life from the Back Roads of Sports. And uh, we wish you the best with this book and all your great work at the Times, John. All right. Thanks, guys. Quite an honor. Thank, thank you very much, John. Happy Appreciate weekend, it, everybody. Thank you. Sheree, what a great show. That Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Before the great go ahead. comments coming in uh, from folks, and, uh, and and that's nice to see. And Laura says, uh, "Thank you for a terrific show. I hope John's listening. Great guest, and I'll have to check out the book." And Sudha Parikh, uh, Neil's mom's watching from Seattle. Hi, Auntie. Great show, and I know Neil gets to say hello to you every week. Hi, mom. <laughs> we we talk at least once a week, right? Kind of, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, Ron Thomas also saying, uh, great show. The A-team did it again. Thank you, Ron. Uh, before we wrap up, Shri, I want to uh, make sure folks know that we have some special shows coming up uh, over the next two weeks. Uh, we're going to do a series of shows focused on the Pentagon Papers. It's the 50th anniversary um, of the Pentagon Papers. June 13th was actually when they were published uh, in 1971. Uh, and we'll have uh, two guests, Linda Amster and Hedrick Smith. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, Linda is in the center of the picture, the only woman in the picture. 
Uh, she was a researcher on the project, and Hedrick Smith is to the right. You see two of the headlines uh, from those days. Vietnam Archive Pentagon study traces three decades of growing U.S. involvement and Vietnam Archive, a consensus to bomb developed before 64 election study says. This is a huge issue. Big shout out uh, to our uh, colleague Carla Baranakis for putting this together and thinking through how we should um, uh, honor this incredible moment in history. So if folks are not familiar with the story, you'll learn more about the Pentagon Papers over the next uh, two weeks. As I mentioned, um, we have a great staff. Sure, you want to, we have a comment from Tom Jolly. Yeah, Tom is the uh, print editor of the New York Times, and we had the privilege of going to his house to read the Sunday paper as Carla brought bagels uh, to read the print, uh, to read the Sunday print paper with the print editor of the New York Times. And he's been a guest during the pandemic also remotely with us, John. Uh, but Tom, thank you so much for all you do. And he says, John is the best. So uh, we, uh, that's a nice uh, compliment. Tom joined us for Father's Day uh, last year during the pandemic, uh, which was great. And uh, in fact, uh, Tom used to be the sports editor for the New York Times and was the one that hired John uh, to, to work at the time. So it, it really is a great connection. And Tom, thank you for all your support of the New York Times read along and for sharing it on Twitter, et cetera. We really appreciate that. Uh, Ellen says thanks and Patricia Freudenberg as well. Uh, uh, Ellen and Patricia both say thank you to the work. Um, before we go, I want to make sure that we uh, do another shout out to our team. Uh, Paula Kiger, Steve Taylor, Julia Weeks, and Carla Baranakis. You see Shri and I on screen, uh, but we have a great team behind us that make sure that we have great guests, that we uh, engage with the audience on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, so I wanted to do a quick shout out uh, to them as well. And as we're talking about Carla Baranakis, I mentioned she's the one that uh, really was the is the brains behind our Pen Pentagon Papers series and all of, a lot of the great guests that we've had. Uh, she also puts out the local connection um, out of uh, uh, Montclair State University. It's the Center for Cooperative Media that puts out the, the newsletter. And uh, each week it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. And best of, best of all, it's free. You can subscribe uh, by going to bit.ly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. Uh, and uh, we would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, that uh, our firm Digimentors that produces the New York Times read along and other shows uh, for clients. We just uh, uh, produced Social Media Weekend last week. We do social and digital consulting, conferences, webinars, uh, talk shows. So if you're interested in having us uh, produce a show like this for you, please uh, feel free to reach out. You can email us at neil uh, at digimentors.group or sri at digimentors.group. Um, so please feel free to reach out uh, and uh, we would be happy to work with you on a program. With that, I think we can call uh, call the show a close. And uh, um, the uh, Ron, I think, is amending. It's not just the A team, it's the AM team, the AM. I guess particularly with John Branch coming from uh, the West Coast. Yeah, joining us at 6.30 a.m. His book is Side Country, Tales of Death and Life in the Side Roads of Sports. Please uh, take a look, the Back Roads of Sports. Please take a look at it and follow him, John Branch NYT on Twitter. And Suda says, looking forward to the two upcoming shows. I came to this country in 1971. So uh, just great to have these fabulous guests coming up the next two weeks. But all year we're here. Uh, Sundays at 8.30 a.m. Thanks very much, everybody. On the personal note, my mom actually uh, came just before the Pentagon Papers. It was a, a few weeks ago that she uh, celebrated her 50th anniversary in the country. So I'm sure that must have been incredible uh, to see this play out a month after landing here. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. And if you caught us in the middle, if you joined halfway uh, in just a, uh, a minute or two, the uh, video will be viewable on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, wherever you might be watching, if you're watching on our website, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. on LinkedIn, and on John's uh, accounts as well. Uh, so thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.